Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the Newark Public Library, Director Christian Zabriskie and the Library Board, welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Ankner, Supervising Librarian of the New Jersey Room here. NPL is proud to co-sponsor this event focused on the archive of the Ironbound Community Corporation. The ICC has been a valued partner of the library in serving the needs of Newarkers. I am particularly proud and excited because for the last couple of years, I have served on a committee that has been providing advice and guidance on the organization of the archive. I have watched with awe as archivist Kat Fanning has begun to organize this huge mass of material to make it more accessible to researchers. I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge some of the other members of the committee, most of, some of whom are here tonight. Uh, former ICC executives, Joe Delafave and Vic DeLuca, current executive Hazel Applewhite, consultant Christine Vogel, archivist Angela Lawrence, Rutgers professor Mark Krasovic, and longtime ICC staff members and activists Nancy Zack and Arnold Cohen. Please help yourself to some food. Take a look at a few of the artifacts brought by Nancy Zack on the table over here, plus the, um, uh, the banner in the back. Uh, and enjoy what promises to be an evening that illuminates the history of one of Newark's most important nonprofit organizations. Thank you. Hello, all, and good night. I'm Daniela Fonseca, associate producer from NJPAC. Uh, on behalf of NJPAC, I want to welcome any, everybody uh, to this panel. I want to thank you for joining us uh, in person and uh, on Zoom. NJPAC has a long history with the Ironbound Community Corporation, otherwise known as ICC. We are honored to present this program, program about their tireless activism and preservation efforts. We thank them for their impact work and for always being a devoted partner in the city of New York with NJPAC. We also want to uh, thank our co-producers for tonight's program, Newark Public Library, in the Newark History Society. And uh, I would like to invite you guys and uh, everybody who's at home or streaming to um, visit njpac.org, our website, to see our programs. We have a very exciting um, season for 24. We have some uh, virtual programs too. The next one will be on uh, November 20. It's a conversation on hip hop part two. Uh, and it's a part of our uh, series, Standing Solidarity. Thank you so much and enjoy the panel. Good evening. I'm Mark Krasovic uh, in the history department at Rutgers Newark and an executive board member with the uh, Newark History Society. And on behalf of the NEH, NHS, sorry, um, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's event. Um, Tim Christ has the night off, so I'm filling in. Um, the NHS is a, is a member organization. It's been around for over 20 years. Um, we invite you to visit the website and find us easily via Google. Uh, check out the membership form and join us. Um, tonight's program is somewhere like the 105th a Newark history program that the society has sponsored. Um, so we appreciate your support over the years and your attendance here tonight. Um, and most relevant to our um, most immediate purpose tonight, I'm also, as Tom mentioned, uh, a member of the ICC Archives Planning Committee. Um, and I hope you won't think less of me as a historian if I say that I can't remember exactly when we got started on this project. Um, I looked at my personal archive um, of this committee and the earliest document I could find was from January of 2020, but I think we started the year before. So we've been, we've been um, meeting and talking um, and dreaming and getting ourselves organized um, and getting the project organized um, for at least four years, I'd say. Um, and I'm happy to say, and I think this is safe to say, that we're on track to actually open the archives and make it public in 2024, right? Okay, cat's nodding her hand, yeah. 
we're very excited about that. Um, and so tonight we have two main purposes. Um, the first of which is to share with you some of uh, the diverse treasures from this archives to give you a sense of uh, what type of material is actually in there. And uh, a second purpose is to um, share with you some of the history of the um, in the neighborhood that it calls home, um, some of the history that is um, in that. Um, so we're going to do that by um, sharing a slideshow uh, with items from the archive and asking a distinguished panelist, uh, panel of speakers um, to comment on the items, both in terms of what information they provide about um, the history of the ICC and about the neighborhood and any just sort of personal, you know, recollections um, or feelings that these archival items um, stir in them. Um, but before we get to that, uh, we want to tell you a little bit more about the archives itself. And for that, I want to introduce the person who has taken sort of the deepest dive into the material itself, um, the person who has gotten her hands dirty, uh, literally, um, and has really led the effort to um, preserve and organize um, and catalog uh, this material. And that's uh, the head archivist on the project, Kat Fanning. So please welcome Kat. Hi, um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I'm Kat Fanning, the processing archivist on the ICC archive. And so none of this would exist, first of all, um, if Nancy had not had the vision to save all of this content. Um, so thank you, Nancy. <laughs> and what's really unique about this archive is not just that it's a community archive, it's actually an institutional archive of a corporation because it was ICC was created for the community, by the community, and continues to serve the community on a day-to-day -day basis in both their programming and in their structural, um, structural work and also their activism and social justice and housing justice and environmental justice. And what the archive, uh, what I've found in the archive is that there's a continual cycle of advocacy work that needs to be done on the same topics here in the Ironbound neighborhood of Newark. And it's really what I hope that everyone will learn from the archive once it's available is that both in digital and physical form that efforts don't need to uh, kind of bloom naturally and end. It can be a continuation by providing this archival material, by providing these primary source materials to lay out and say, we've been doing this since day one. This is a, this is a, a, a march we did in 79, 92, 2002, and again here in 2022. And that's what I hope the archive will do to serve the community. Additionally, a primary goal of mine is not just to process everything pre-2023, but is to build in sustainable practices into ICC to empower staff to continually add content to the, to the archive as they continue uh, well into the future. So every year there will be a process of adding new material, making new material available to show the history of ICC and how it's really served the community so that this archive can serve as a live version of a uh, record, of live, uh, a live version of the record of everything that ICC has done. Um, whether it is providing community care, uh, child care, uh, I think it was Meals on Wheels for the Elderly, there's a constant need to assess what the community needs and respond to that. And Ironbound is in a unique opportunity to continue to provide that support. And they are also the best equipped to continue to provide that source of uh, support as members of the Ironbound community, and the Ironbound neighborhood. And so I think with that, let's get into it. You'll see um, a lot of material um, and some of it is digitized already. Some of it's not, some of it's mold affected and some of it is not. So thank you very much.
is hanging out. So as the panelists are taking their seats, I'll just say, um, as Kat alluded to, this is a incredibly thin slice of the amount, the, the riches, the treasures um, in this archive. Um, and, and some very exciting stuff, but by all means, not all of it. Um, and we'll get through as much of it as we can tonight and hope to get us all out of here by like 10 or 1030. Just, just joking. We'll be we'll be done much sooner than that. Okay, so I want to start by um, introducing the panelists real quick. Um, and I have an alphabetical order, and they almost sat in alphabetical order as well, but not quite. Um, so I'll start um, nearest to me, uh, Hazel Applewhite. Um, Hazel has been at the ICC for I think about fifteen years. Oops, yeah. Um, 11 of which uh, she served the ICC as the CFO. Um, then she served as a time of the CFO and COO at the same time. Um, and then she was tapped to be the interim CEO. And then a little over a year ago, uh, became the permanent CEO of the ICC. Permanent, not like for all time, but as long as you, as long as you want to do it. Ever, she's never there. <laughs> um, and next we have Anna Baptista. Um, who uh, I don't know exactly when she started um, her involvement with the ICC from about birth Nine years. Um, and uh, currently serves the ICC as a trustee um, and is also an associate professor of environmental policy and sustainability management at the new school. Okay, so Anna Baptista. And then next to Anna, we have Joe Delafave. Um, who I think it's enough to say was the executive director of ICC for 29 years, um, from I think it's 1991 to 2019. So very long time, several decades. <laughs> Joe? And then finally, last but not least, um, Arnold Cohen, um, who was on staff at the ICC for about 20 years. Um, in positions ranging from bus driver to daycare, teacher, worker, um, housing organizer, um, a staff organizer for um, many years, and is currently um, the senior policy advisor at the Housing and Community Development Network of New Jersey. Welcome, Arnold. So I mentioned initially um, two main purposes of us being here tonight, um, to check out what's in the archive or get a, get a taste of what's in the archive and to explore the history of the ICC um, and the Ironbound neighborhood. Um, but there's a third purpose um, of tonight's discussion and I think of the project, of the archiving project as a whole. Um, and that's to think a bit um, about the role that an archive can play in the life of an organization and in the life of a community. Um, you know, why has the ICC invested so much time and energy into preserving and organizing and making accessible um, its archive? What is important about, um, you know, honoring one's history in that way? And how does it help the organization and the development of the neighborhood? Um, you know, I think this is, for me, this is a really fascinating question. Like, I'm a historian. Um, I could, like, geek out on this stuff all the time. <laughs> but, but what is the ICC? Um, see, uh, you know, what power does it see in, um, you know, the collection and the telling of its history? Um, so we wanted to actually start tonight's um, panel discussion um, by honoring the person, you know, whose vision this all really was. Um, and that's Nancy Zach. It, and if you don't know Nancy, she's sitting over there in the purple ICC shirt with the blue Newark <laughs> cap on. Um, and you could recognize her from the photos. Um, Nancy is also a longtime organizer with the ICC, um, began there in the mid 1970s. Um, and, you know, for my money, in addition to all that amazing organizing work she does, the amazing organizing mind that she has, um, She's sort of a, the, the project philosopher on that question that I just raised, 
on like, why are we doing this? Um, why is the ICC doing this? Um, you know, what purposes can it serve um, in an organization um, and in a community to further their goals of, uh, you know, justice and equity um, in that neighborhood and beyond. Um, so we wanted to start by by honoring Nancy and telling you a little bit more about her um, role in all of this. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the panel to start exploring this and maybe Anna, you get us started. Uh, sure, Nancy. I I'd love to. Anytime, any chance I get to honor Nancy. Look at her holding up the book. <laughs> uh, I'll just say a few words. You know, I when I was a kid growing up um, in, on Shock Street, I found my way to ICC through Nancy, through June, who lived on my block. She lived up the block from me and, and knocked on our doors. And, and Nancy was very much, she, I remember her telling me, don't worry. I said, my parents can't go. They don't speak English. And she's like, don't worry. We do everything, Portuguese, Spanish, English. You, they can come, just come. Um, and, and we went and that was the beginning of a long journey with ICC. And, um, you know, when I worked at ICC, have to admit, I was a brat. I was like, why is Nancy hoarding like all of these documents? There's papers everywhere. And, you know, as a young person, you know, it's easy to get, you know, you're like, oh, this is this is messy, you know, like um, I didn't I didn't really fully appreciate what Nancy was really curating. You know, she was uh, the person who read the newspaper religiously. So, you know, any little thing the city put in the public notification sheet, cut it right out and everybody had a copy of it and knew what was happening and um, and spread the word of mouth to, to, to neighbors. And um, that documentation, that physical papers, you know, and having the flyers like, you know, did you see these these documents? You know, um, I think we've, you know, now in the digital age, like we don't even appreciate that so much of what we knew really came through paper, like through uh, the material flyers, you know, we didn't have you know, the apps and stuff. So you had to like put flyers up all over the neighborhood and go door to door and talk to people. And, um, you know, so Nancy really taught me the value of that, of, of um, treasuring the little things that most people would just throw away and throw in the garbage and not really see the purpose of it. And she really had the vision of like, no, this is an important part of our story. Like we have important stories to tell that most people don't appreciate or don't see, um, but it's those things, those little, those flyers that tell the neighborhood in three languages come out. Um, those are important memories that mark the, the, the neighborhoods taking a stand. And I, you know, so I, looking back, very much appreciate and apologize for being such a brat <laughs> and moving your piles around like um uh, and and I'm so grateful because because of your persistence and your vision um that you were able to preserve so much of our history right and pass it on because now we have a link to our past a material link to our past that we can continue to carry forward to future generations in the neighborhood. So I really am grateful. Thank you so much, Nancy, for, for showing us uh, that it is important to hold on to things. Maybe not all the things. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. Does anybody else want to add something about Nancy? I know we... Yeah, I adore her. I don't know if Arnold knows her, but rest... she's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. But just um kind of echoing all the sentiments of what Honor said regarding Nancy and the history and preserving the history and just touching on a point regarding, you know, us being able to view that history and move it on and even uh, show that history to our youths, right? So they can understand the path that we've walked, right? And this journey that we've walked for the past 55 plus years, um, and also how it is possible to see changes, right? And that's reflected in history. So it's also um, not only, you know, of course, a recognition to Nancy, but also the recognition to how change can come above and using that history as a learning tool. Thank you. And just one more thing, I, I would say, you know, since we're talking history, um, you know, 
Nancy is, you know, among the first in a line of just really strong women in the organization. Uh, Nancy, June Krasuski, uh, Sister Carol, uh, Anna Baptista, uh, just one after another that have really been um, leaders and backbone and, uh, you know, the strength of this organization. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, so much of this organization has been always women, um, but a few of us uh, standing on their shoulders. That's, that's always been the case. The, the organization actually started, you know, being, being, being the oldest, the, the person who goes back the longest here. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I got you all beat in terms of admiration for Nancy since I married her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was, it was a group of women going down to Trenton to call for funding for a daycare center community-run daycare center in the, in the Ironbound. That was uh, the first program. And it was the strength of women that got that started and brings us to today. Yeah. Thank you all very much. I'll, I'll just add really quickly, since we're ahead of time, actually, um, <laughs> that the first time I met Nancy, and I don't know if you would remember this, was when I was um, a postdoc at Rutgers Newark at the um, institute that Clem and Price had founded. And Clem asked me one day to go over and knock on the door of the offices above TM Ward's coffee shop um, <laughs> and meet somebody named Nancy Zach there um, because the office was closing down and we needed to box up all the records and take them away. I don't know where they went that day exactly, but, um, but so I did. I, I did whatever Clem asked me to do and went over <laughs> Um, I met Nancy, and it was also the first day that I met Gail Malmgren, um, who is also a member of the New York History Society. Um, and we we spent the day getting our hands dirty, um, boxing up all these records for, and that was the the HUD Tenants Coalition yep. office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now those are, I think, at the library. Right. They're at the NPL. Um, so that was like 2008 or 2009. Um, so I met Nancy for the first time in the context of archiving. And so now this has come full circle um, with this stuff. So. Okay. Um, and I'll just mention um, then, and Anna worked on this um, as well. Um, then Nancy roped me into um, doing um, an archival um, project surrounding the ICC's environmental justice work. Trying to get back to the last slide, but um, that's fine. But you'll notice on um, you may have noticed on the right side of that slide um, that is a finding aid um, that is at the Van Buren Branch Library in the Ironbound for a um, smaller collection of environmental justice um, related material. Um, and that, I think of that little archive um, and the sort of like quirky, wonderful finding aid that Nancy put together in this binder for it mm -hmm. as, you know, probably the most immediate um, predecessor to this larger um, ICC archive. So that was kind of, kind of the proof of concept that people would come, um, people were interested in the ICC and in the Ironbound, um, and they would use this archive. Um, we were able to use that in um, raising money and support for this current archive project. So we'll hear more about that later, I'm sure. Um, so among uh, the wealth of material in the ICC archives is, um, as you'll see on this slide and on others, just a ton of paper um, of all sorts, of publications, of flyers, of leaflets, of um, memos, of posters, um, you name it. And so we wanted to start um, sort of our history of or our exploration of the ICC's history with this early brochure laying out um, some of its projects um, in some of its uh, earliest years. And Arnold started talking about um, some of the origins of ICC. But Arnold, can you talk a little bit more about these early programs and the origins of the organization? Sure. So this 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 brochure would have been uh, in the early 70s, by which time Ironbound had grown from a daycare center that was on 146 Wilson Avenue. Parents were concerned about what happens to their kids' education when they leave that daycare center. So they started a community school and were actually able to get funding for the Board of Education for a short time to have that school run. And then a group of us 
uh, started an office on 95 Fleming Avenue as outreach and referral so that we could be there in the middle of the eastern end of higher bound, lower income area to hear directly from people about what they were facing and how to help them directly with everything from filling out forms to people coming in crying about the airplane noise and we need to be doing something about it. Um, and out of that office on 95 Fleming Avenue, it gave birth to the Ironbound Voices. We had a community health project that had a, a mobile van that went to the different housing projects in Ironbound and gave full screening with our own pediatric nurse for kids on Medicaid. Uh, and we had a senior program. And you know, so, that, so there was a whole breadth and, and adult education. So out of the beginnings of an office on 95 Fleming, we really then took a, a, a big jump from just the basic education functions of having a daycare center and then a community school, to really outreaching into addressing all the diff those different needs of the community. And, and, and the philosophy behind it all was community, community. So a lot of these programs that you see there, health fan, the senior, senior ride, were all being run by people who lived either in the neighborhood or close by within the city of Newark. Yeah, um, welcome to everybody. Uh, I, I did want to uh, just mention that there are some, uh, a lot of friends here. Thank you for coming. Some current and former staff, uh, but I did also want to mention um, that presence of my predecessor and uh, longtime executive director before me, yep. Victor Luca is here. Hello, yep. Vic. <laughs> so I, I, I did want to just pick up on what Arnold was saying a moment ago and what he said a few minutes before that, because what you really have seen here is that um, this organization was created by people in the community, you know, uh, driven by needs that they saw in the community, uh, whether it was the children's center where moms got together. Uh, whether it was uh, people in the uh, um, in the school and in the daycare center who thought a health project should uh, was necessary for their kids, um, you know, people in that project seeing asthma, you know, occurring, and you know, what's the relationship between that and in the environment around us? Um, so, you know, what you see early on is a foundation of a real community-based organization. You also see from the very beginning progressive viewpoints, you know, being established. You know, moms from different backgrounds getting together and recognizing the, you know, the needs, the common needs of, of all people. You know, the philosophy of the preschool in terms of, you know, giving, uh, addressing the needs of the whole child, um, hugging children, uh, um, you know, a very progressive education viewpoint, you know, all of that. And, and, and what that daily association with the people in the community means is building relationships and trust. And I, I say all of that because, you know, that community-based nature of it, that progressive worldview, building relationships and trust becomes the foundation for successful activism in succeeding years. You just can't step out there and say, I want a demonstration of something. You have to have a relationship. And people at the very beginning of this organization showed everybody else how to build those relationships within the community, which everybody carried on in succeeding years, you know, throughout our over 50 years of history. And that's what we have always striven to do is be community driven, you know, be there alongside, in front of when necessary, behind when necessary, but always, you know, with community people. Um, and without that, you're not going to have any success. And before we leave this slide, I wanted to ask you, Hazel, as the current um, CEO, when you hear about these earliest programs and see this brochure, what do you see? Do you see continuity? Do you see like development and difference and evolution or a bit of both? I see a bit, a bit of both. But I also see that um, a lot of the work that we've done throughout the years have actually evolved into the work that we're doing now. Um, when we talk about the preschool, for example, and that notion around that holistic approach, um, it's 55 years later, and we're still doing programs around that holistic approach. In order for a child to be successful, and this has always been the notion 55 years ago, the family have to be successful. 
the needs within that family have to be met in order for the parents to then be active and healthy parents to that child. So to answer your question, we've continued with that, right? Because it's not, um, it's not unknown. It is a formula that if it's done right, you can see the product of a progressive citizen when that child turns 18 and also a responsible citizen. So I hope that answers your question. And before I continue, I just wanna acknowledge, like Jill said, we have a lot of friends, a lot of folks that I've seen for many, many years in the audience. Thank you so much for coming. And we also have our youths. And I just wanna applaud you for stepping up in front and sitting down and listening to the history of the organization that you're part of. I believe this is our basketball group here, I think. Charles can confirm, I think so, but I just wanna really recognize you and thank you for coming. Thank you so much. So, yeah, I mean, every slide I'm gonna say some version of this, like I would love this material. This is a real treasure in the archive. Um, but here, here's um, you know, a sampling of some of the ways that the ICC has gotten the word out, has reached out to the community um, of the Ironbound and in fact beyond um, through uh, its trilingual Ironbound Voices uh, newspaper, through the Ironbound Insights uh, television show hosted by Vic DeLuca, um, and in this still also featuring Arnold. Um, and more recently through its um, really um, lively, dynamic social media campaign. You know, and, and all of this is archived. Um, all of this, you know, the entire run of Ironbound Voices, the run of Ironbound Insights, and like most impressively to me, the, the social media, the digital aspects, because I have no idea how that stuff gets archived, but Kat knows how to do it and has done it. Um, all of this stuff is archived now. So um, I wonder, Anna, maybe if you can get us um, started thinking uh, about the importance of this. Yeah, I mean, I always appreciate a good comic strip or, <laughs> you know, poking fun a little bit. You know, there's a the work that our organizers do that uh, neighborhood residents and staff do is is hard work, right? It is difficult work, um, not just in early, all the way from early education to meeting the needs of residents who are in crisis, responding to Hurricane Sandy the constant environmental justice fights, right, against powerful industries, powerful politicians sometimes. Um, those are difficult David and Goliath fights, but Ironbound not only called community together to protest and fight and do direct action, they would often do it with humor and also through community uh, vehicles. So very accessible to, to, to uh, any resident to participate. Um, and I just remembered reading, like, you know, I always enjoyed a good little, like, poke and dig at the powers that be, you know, when we were in a, we're in a, we're in a fight and it looks like we're never going to win. It feels like, oh my God, how are we going to fight these big industries or these very powerful people? You know, we're just this little tiny community. Um, but we did and residents would come out, we, you know, we didn't have the money, but we had the people and. Uh, Maria Lopez Nunez, who's the current uh, director of EJ, has you know really grown and expanded that fight with all I see all her staff here, um, and they've continued that tradition in the social media presence that ICC has. You see that uh, you know the they have like a Halloween themed campaign around so many fights. We had three fight they last year there were three fights right PVSC uh, wanting to put a power plant, Aries sludge plant, and um, how did they deal with all these fights? Well, they created all these amazing memes, calling the community out together, um, sending messages to the governor, little love notes to the governor. Um, you know, so I, I uh, you know, we have to laugh or we're gonna cry, right? Sometimes we also have to call each other in. It has to be, there has to be some joy, some fun, some celebration, as well as the fight. So um, I think, so much of the diversity of how we reached out to the community speaks to that um, to that spirit, right? We have a very spicy spirit in the Ironbound Voices. Mm -hmm. you, I, I just want to note that you see a, a cover of Ironbound Voices there, and uh, this was uh, first started back in the 70s, and 
Nancy has preserved every issue of Ironbound Voices and more than one copy of it. So the, the, the Ironbound Voices actually went on for 22 years. And what one example of fun stuff like Anne is talking about so we're fighting the airplane noise coming over Ironbound with flights, you know, constantly directed over our neighborhood. One of the things we did is we dressed up uh, for Christmas and we, we put in our, 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 our you know, Santa, Santa suits and we went in the lobby and we sang Christmas carols with words about, you know, reroute the planes, get them away from us. And it was just a lot of fun. That was a great way to, to talk to people there about our issues without being too heavy. Mm -hmm. And some of those tactics um, led a foundation or two to say, you're too much on the edge here. We're going to cut your funding. And, um, and we had to um, work to get that funding back. Uh, and that same foundation later in a few years, some years later, um, did the introduction to identify to a, an award that the organization got for our cutting edge organizing. <laughs> Somebody's gonna have to dig those lyric sheets out of the archive, I think. Have you seen them? Yeah, okay, cool. They're there. And, and the, I just wanna say the other thing with the Iron Bound, Bound Voices is, is that uh, through Newark Public Library, uh, Digital Newark, you can see every single copy of the Iron Bound Voices. And insights will, well, actually, I, I think I'm right about this. We are now working on a grant that would hopefully raise some funds to digitize um, insights, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the idea? Okay, maybe, we'll let you know later. And, and we should note the that the, 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 the shot of Ironbound Insights, uh, which is the TV show, Vic preserved all the shows that he did, unlike myself, did not preserve the shows that I did mm -hmm. somehow. <laughs> but to get a taste, there's a couple episodes on but, YouTube. So if you, if you look at um, Ironbound Insights, that's where I got this. Um, still from. So How many years of that did you do? Fabulous. All right, moving along. Go. Um, more paper. Um, so this this is you know this is the bulk of the archive. It's just these like massive amounts of paper. Um, and we could have chosen any number of flyers um, to represent some of the work um, of the ICC. Um, but these represent specific campaigns, um, but also different methods of uh, mobilizing the community. So I'm wondering if, if you guys would like to comment on, you know, explain a little bit about some of the specific campaigns and also um, a little more about methods. Anna, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm, yeah the Passaic one is we still we still are trying to clean up the Passaic River, but <laughs> um, but it's happening. It's gonna happen. <laughs> but the the development of the waterfront, um, you know, if you go today in Newark, I mean, maybe the kids now you see the orange boardwalk and the orange sticks. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, and I know a lot of people here, the waterfront, you didn't even go near the waterfront because you were like, the waterfront, water's toxic. The waterfront was very hard to get to. Um, some, some kids didn't even know there was a river there because it's hard, it was hard to see even. Um, but it was a very industrial waterfront, a lot of contamination, a lot of pollution. And um, there was a, always the idea or the hope that we would have a park on the waterfront you know, because we don't have that many parks in the Iron Man. We have very few parks. Um, so residents, you know, always did a, a lot of visioning. There was a master, you know, this one I think in the middle is from our, uh, the city didn't want to do any waterfront planning. They wanted to develop it or, um, so the neighborhood did their own waterfront plan, right? We did community meetings, we hired our own firm and we did develop our own vision of what the waterfront could be. And then they also did um, a march, right, uh, uh, to the river. Um, and maybe Joe can talk about the, the ribbon uh, campaign. Um, but, you know, the, the redevelopment of that riverfront was a dream that residents had for a long time. And uh, for many, at many points, it was going to be a heliport or, like, the site of more industry or, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. 
uh, but not a public waterfront. And so the fact that we have that waterfront now is the product of decades of trying to organize residents and fight for that public access way. But maybe Joe, you could say something more or um, Arnold about the sure. ribbon. So, so yeah, so, so the ribbon was just, again, it's, it's a unique way in terms of organizing and getting the community involved. So those ribbons, you know, Nancy's creation was you know, senior citizens in, in the neighborhood when they're getting out their meetings, uh, work to fold them, put them on, on, on the paper uh, to say that we need save to have that riverfront walk. And, but it was not only just bringing them out and for a lot of older people, it might be hard for them to get out to march. They were able to involve them by physically you know, creating 5,000 ribbons that were then people used, it was a symbol. And, you know, for a long time, as I said, there was the riverfront was used for containers. You could not see beyond the containers that were blocking the view of the river. And now you can see the river, and it's the best. <laughs> you talk about environmental justice. Those containers were abutting the bedroom windows of Terrell Homes. Absolutely. I mean, literally, they were on Newark Housing Authority property allowed by the Housing Authority, the city of Newark. Sure. Uh, to put containers five stories high uh, in front of the projects. Um, you know, they're complete disregard uh, for the people who live there. Um, you know, I, I think there's something important here also um, in the value of community organizations in the city of Newark, the long-term value. When I came to Ironbound in 1991, one of the projects Vic hand, handed off to me, you know, was this notion of a riverfront park. Um, so, you know, from 1991 and earlier, we had on our map, on our agenda, a riverfront park. And it was actually after the Riverbank Park struggle, you know, when, because we've always been fighting things, no incinerators, don't close our park, don't close the fire station. And always saying, don't do this, don't do that. And after Riverbank Park, we said, you know, maybe it's time we start figuring out what we want. And we started doing community planning. And out of that community planning came an open space plan, a master plan, a waterfront plan, um, some of which I have here, which you can't see, <laughs> um, but all of it, and everything driven through community meetings and bringing people together to do this vision. You'll see some of that later. But I, I, I just want to stress the importance of, you know, the community, not only being a grassroots organization, the, the organization, but virtually being an institution in the city of Newark. And as an institution, we've been here over 50 years, and you have that, you know, stability and credibility and long time, you know, long term vision to carry, you know, what's an initially just a community, you know, we'd love to have a, a green riverfront. And after 20, 25 years, seeing the success of it being built, I would be bold enough to say that without Ironbound Community Corporation's advocacy, continued push for this with the mayor, with the county executive and everybody else, there'll be no riverfront park today. And, you know, we raised the first $3 million when Anna com come to me and she says, I want to sue the incinerator. <laughs> Maybe don't mention that part. <laughs> and, and we did sue the incinerator, uh, you know, with, with her push and leadership on that. They settled $3 million. We gave it to Joe D. We said, build us a park. Joe D said, it's not enough. He said, go to the Port Authority. We went to the Port Authority, put $9 million in it. We and Spark and Down Next Sports Group, we got Green Acres money. We raised, you know, most of the money for that park that Jody agreed to plan and build. And we got Corey the same thing to say, okay. Um, you know, I just wanted, you know, just the importance of community organizations in the city of Newark and people's visions. And we can't lose sight of that. Otherwise we're gonna get displaced. And Hazel, like maybe sort of a similar question to the first one I asked you, but, but more focused on methods. Um, you see an evolution of methods, continuity? Mm -hmm. Always evolution, but definitely definitely aligned with the history. Um, so the method of doing community planning, we're still doing that today. Um, if there are issues within the community, we are pulling in community members. We are educating them about uh, regarding the issue because Education, and I'm not talking about formal education, right? But sometimes, you know, the understanding of what's going on, it's just not really there. So we're educating them upon it. Then we're pulling them together. 
We're planning, right? Doing planning around community issues, advocacy around community issues, um, which is like the same that we're seeing here, right? So it's us carrying forward the history um, of what Vic, Arnold, Nancy, Joe, right, have, have set the foundation for. Like I said, the formula, right, that was developed, it's, it's, it's a working formula. Of course, it evolved with time, but it definitely worked. And like Joe said, we're about community. It's about the community. So if it's really about the community, you're going to get community input. Those decisions are not going to be made in my office or in a program office. It's going to be made with community members at the table having a voice and input. Thank you. Now, I just want to um, add these examples that we're using tonight have come from a couple different sources. Um, but I want to give like another shout out to Kat because she took these, well, for me, were these really evocative photos of some of that mold affected material that had to be digitized first and then um, disposed of. Um, but it's, you know, beautiful, wonderful material. And she did these photos that, um, you know, it seemed like you had a stack of documents and she would take a photo of the top one and take it off and then take a photo of the next one. And what's so evocative is that you see that like enticing stack of uh, other material below, um, you know, the thing that's being featured. So I just, I really love the, the photos that you sent us, Kat. And then some of the images are also from stuff that um, Nancy has pulled out of, I keep saying like her kitchen cabinets and closets and um, vanity and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but we'll be a part of the archive um, if Arnold has anything to say about it soon. <laughs> uh, okay. And photos. Um, I, I don't know if this is common for most community organizations, but Somebody was always taking photos, it seems to me, of everything the ICC was doing. And just this incredibly rich, um, huge photo, archival photo um, collection. So we wanted to share um, some photos of um, you know, the ICC mobilizing people um, out on the streets. Um, and similar to the last slide, I'd love for you guys to talk about the specific campaigns that you see represented here and what's going on. And, just any observations you might have about, um, you know, the photos themselves as archival documents. So I don't know who's up next, but whoever wants to get started. <laughs> I'll start. I just want to note that in this photo, I have hair. <laughs> <laughs> you see Joe in the dark, the dark jacket. Are you bragging about having hair, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> so, so since you were there, Joe, what, what was land for learning? Um, well, you know, after the leaflets and after everything else that you distribute, you know, you got to have a uh, show another presence, uh, you know, to the authorities. And, uh, you know, so it's not just uh, dropping leaflets in the street and uh, who cares about that. Um, so here, yeah, we're putting people on a street in different ways. This particular photo is, um, you know, when the state, um, the state Supreme Court uh, issued Abbott decisions in 1998, 1999. Um, one of those decisions was that the poorest districts in the state of New Jersey needed to assess their schools and um, uh, either rehab and or build new ones that would meet uh, standards so that uh, kids in districts like Newark would have the same type of facilities as people in other districts like Milburn or someplace like that. And it was all part of an overall education reform effort that was won through the courts. And uh, this was a part of a citywide effort. Uh, this wasn't just an Ironbound effort, but uh, Nancy and others organized a citywide coalition called Land for Learning. And we said, if we're gonna build schools, we gotta start preserving land right now. Uh, identified in lands that where we can build schools before the developers get their hands on them. And our master plan, in fact, that we issued uh, in 2001, um, in fact, call it in the, uh, the, the areas where uh, we knew there were vacant lots and the best places where there could be schools. So this was a land for learning, uh, pushing uh, the mayor, uh, Sharp James and the, and the school district to make sure they got ahead of the curve and um, we would have the land necessary when the money came down. So and, and, and what you see is it's another example of tremendous success. So we, you know, we now have, for people that know the Ironbound, we have a new, new Oliver Street School. South Street School has been replaced. Yep. 
So we have, you know, beautiful brand new state of the art schools coming fast forward. Uh, I just want to point out real quickly on, on the uh, upper right. <laughs> All right, Nancy wants to sh show off the, this kid uh, from South Street right. School who made, drew images of and, and wrote their hopes and dreams for a new school. <laughs> so they got their new school. They were one of the few kids that got the school. Well, so maybe the we could share it sent. and we could pass it around if you don't mind. Wasn't the only book she sent to the mayor, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and just on the, in the upper right hand corner, you see Pastor Molisier, uh and it's an example of how we involve the churches and the clergy uh, in our organizing fights. You know, you had, you know, from Our Lady of Fatima, the biggest Portuguese church, the pastor telling people to go out and join the marches that we're having. Um, and we had an Ironbound Ecumenical Society that had a yearly uh, service to raise money for the Ironbound Committee Against Toxic Waste and the work that we're doing. So there's kind of, of, of you know, both citywide, cross religions, um, very important to the organizing. Uh, the, the corner one there is the late, that wasn't the latest because there was another March yeah, after that one, one. Yeah. Yeah. right? Last yeah. year. That either. was the major storm. But that, <laughs> that was sort of, yeah. right? Remember, we, we were like, oh, well, there's, the organizers from ICC were like, we're gonna go, we're gonna march to the, the incinerator. We've been fighting this incinerator for since before it was even built, right? So a lot of the marches you actually saw were incinerator, anti-incinerator marches before it was built. Then it got built, but the community's still living with a lot of the pollution from that incinerator. Um, so uh, there was a, a march organized. <laughs> when, when was this snowstorm? November? It must have been October. Yeah. 18, I 2018. Think, right? People yeah. could not get home. That, that was the storm where everybody got stuck in their cars yeah, for exactly. seven and eight hours. So we didn't see it coming. We're like, this is a great day to do a march <laughs> with like 200 kids. <laughs> so we started out from Hawkins Street School. With a lot of kids from that um, neighborhood and parents and, and, and residents. Um, and as we're walking, the snow starts piling on and we're like, maybe we should abandon ship. And the kids were like, no, no, we're going all the way to the incinerator. The kids were very uh, adamant <laughs> about marching um, and they were they were troopers because uh, it was very cold. And we marched through a very industrial part of the neighborhood to get to the to the incinerator. Um, but it shows the like perseverance and the resilience to of, of the of the neighborhood. Like nothing was gonna stop them from getting uh, the march done. And I think the the threat is also like a lot of groups have protests and like do direct action. But ICC, uh, I can say with a lot of confidence, I have the organizers here in the room. Will can bring people out. When we say there's a community event or there's a community action. You know, we can get hundreds of people out in the streets, marching, going to City Hall, testifying, going to Trenton. And, you know, that's that is a testament to the connections that the, the organization has to the residents, not just in times of crisis when people need to come out and fight, but also in times of celebration and in times of coming together. So I think it's a beautiful um, thing that people want to come out and want to feel part of the, the community. Um, so yeah, I was very proud of the kids for, you know, sticking with a very, that was a tough march, that one, the, yep. the, the snow yep. march. I don't know, Hazel, if you've you got some recent. But it was fun to throw hard. snowballs City at the incinerator. <laughs> 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 Those are our young leaders of the future right there. I want to touch on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't win every battle. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. Oh. Hazel, you wanted to add something? Yes. Uh, just picking back on what Anna said about the leaders, right, and our environmental leaders and our leaders for the future, right, involving children, because I'm quite sure the individual, and we've had this happen, right? Oh, I see myself in that photo, right? It's a <laughs> lesson, it's teaching, it's, it's you know, also having our kids understand you don't have to settle. Also our community, Indy, I am bound. You have um, 
of that may be from other countries, right? Um, South America, Central America, Portuguese, right? It's like a you know what we call multicultural, multi multicultural, and it's important for our community members to understand your voice matters, right? Um, and if things are happening in your that are affecting yeah. your Yeah, great. If things are happening within your community that's uh, affecting your health, affect, affecting your day-to-day -day life, it is your responsibility as a citizen to respond. And I think one, that's one of the great things that ICC does, right, which is, again, involved in community. And you know, like we had seniors writing, um, you know, our our parents, it's not just one individual, it's the entire community that's getting involved for this change that we would like to see. And like Joe said, sometimes we don't win all battles, but I think the learning around this is that you can still fight. Right, and you can still move on, and you can still fight, and eventually you will see what you, you know the results that you want to see. It may not happen on the first try, and that's also teaching our kids also that you may try, and you you know it may not happen, but you can pick back up and go again because life you're going to have that in life, right? So it's also a life learning lesson. I don't, you can't prove a negative, but my guess is is that. You know, when the authorities know that they're in for a fight, uh, there's probably been many a thought, many an action on their part that they didn't do. Absolutely. But they didn't want to, they didn't want to engage in the fight. This was a, a great segue to the next um, slide. Which was about victories. <laughs> <laughs> um, May not win them all, but there have been some major um, victories, some of which have been touched on um, before. But Joe, do you have more to say about the park? Well, I, you know, one thing I'll say is, you know, we did a lot of community. Er, 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 it's not just organizing, but it's also getting people in a room to share a vision, to do planning, and, um, and, and get people stimulated around that, too. So we did a lot around that on the riverfront, as we do with the master plan and everything. One of the things we did is to look at the top two um, is that if you look at the top one, that was the riverfront. And then you look at the next one and you do a slideshow and one, one morphs, you know, blends right into the other. And you can see what it can look like. And, and, and this gets people excited too, you know, thinking, you know, wow, so this is what we can, can have. And yeah, I want to make sure that we're, we're, we're going to work for this. We're going to fight for this. I'm, I'm on board. You know, this is what we want. And um, and we may want to change that picture. Let's get some ideas on what else we can put there, not just that. But the visioning process, I think, is really important that a lot of people, and we've, we've had community meetings with visioning. We've had so many plans that we've done, the master plan, the recreation open space plan, the waterfront plan, um, uh, our brownfields plan, uh, the down bottoms uh, uh, plan, East Ferry, uh, East Ironbound revitalization project, one after another. And we were literally putting 100 people in a room to do visioning and planning. And, um, you know, and when people, and, and you invite others to that. When I say others, I mean developers. So people can see that, you know, this is not just some, you know, something that was thought of in the back room of Ironbound Community Corporation. This is a community plan with community people behind it. I better get on board or I'm not, you know, rub up elbows up with a bunch of people here. So, uh, you know, that, and in the end, you can see what, what the result is. This is Riverfront, one aspect of Riverfront Park, near Terrell Homes, uh, which is a whole nother matter. We don't have time for that probably, but this is, what, this is what all that ends up in after 25 years of fighting and planning and visioning and advocacy work. work. So I just wanted to point out the Ironbound Voices there uh, talks about two of our, our victories against major 
toxic waste polluters, folks that uh, were looking at sea incineration, was looking at taking the most dangerous waste, too dangerous to be dealt with on land, so they're going to put it on a ship, put it out in the water. Uh, they were going to do one off of Port Newark. They're going to do one in the Gulf of Mexico. They're going to do one off the coast of California. They had guaranteed loans from the Maritime Administration from the federal government. We fought them, and we won. Uh, you know, and and you know, I, I went down to uh, to uh, to Alabama to speak in solidarity with the folks down there when they were having a hearing about their ocean incineration proposal. Um, and we were actually able to feed. There was six uh, proposals for incinerators for our neighborhood. We defeated five of them. And these are major corporations. SCA, which is the other one there. We went, went down, uh, uh, Bob Cartwright, a colleague of ours, went down to, to Washington, looked at the congressional record where they were being held before a congressional committee because of their ties to organized crime. Um, we talked to people working for, for the police and the attorney general's office. We were able to bring out that whole record that stopped them in their tracks in terms of, again, taking some of these most dangerous chemicals, and in that case, burning down uh, towards the end of Ferry Street. Uh, Passaic Valley Sewage Commission wanted to build the world's largest sewage, they bragged about this, the world's largest sewage sludge incinerator they wanted to put right there in our neighborhood. And they have enough sewage to create that. We stopped that. So um, it's, it's just important to realize that we have been very successful. And even though we have one garbage incinerator, that was the only one that was able to get through with mm -hmm. all these other proposals. Mm -hmm. Anna and Hazel, are there other victories not represented here that, that come to mind? <laughs> yeah, recent, recently, uh, we, uh, ICC, with the help of coalition partners, defeated the ARI sludge proposal. It was, a, it was like a done deal. The financing was in place. The mm -hmm. corporation was going to come and uh, burn, take sludge from, from all over and, mm -hmm. and burn it in the neighborhood. And they were defeated after many, many uh, folks came out against it. And ICC organized a fierce opposition to it with residents. So that was a recent one. Mm -hmm. The Ironbound Community Corporation led the efforts. You know, Maria Lopez Nunez and a whole group, Kim Gaddy, Melissa Miles, all these folks around the, the, the city and the state passed the country's strongest environmental justice law yep. in the country, yep. the first and strongest in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And, and now people, people call us from all over the country. I know they're always constantly asking Maria and, and others in the state of New Jersey to come to their state and share how we were able to pass such a strong law. Mm -hmm. And the reason we were able to pass such a strong law is because we had uh, a very powerful group of uh, residents and coalitions that came together and really pushed that. So Newark has really been leading uh, and ICC has been at the front of that leadership. So it's not just, there's a lot of losses, <laughs> But there are victories that we could see, and 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 I, I'm sure Hazel has other ones. I, you know, the Aries one is the most recent. Yeah, actually, yeah. one uh, maybe about mm, seven years ago, the inclusionary zoning audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big one, right? Um, affordability, as we know, um, it's great to have development, but it needs to be development without displacement. Because what happens is our community members that have been living here for many, many years, some, some of them can be over 50 years, right? With developers coming in, they can get displaced because the rent becomes unaffordable. So the inclusionary zoning audience that was um, led by Joe um, doing his time allowed for affordability within units. Um, and Joe can speak more to that, but that was one of our wins. And I think that was a great win to the city because again, housing rights is very important, right? It's, 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 it's a basic right. And that should not be challenged because of income. And I think, you know, these couple of things that were just mentioned, um, you know, also show that the organization has not you know, obviously we're first and foremost about, you know, the health and welfare of the neighborhood. But, you know, going back to the early days and Vic with the Low Income Housing Coalition, um, the HUD Tenants Coalition, our work across the city, you know, and trying to build that bridge over the 
the, tr the, uh, the train lines, uh, you know, has always been important to, to the, or the organization. And more recently, the environmental justice ordinance, the inclusionary zoning ordinance, and Rich Camareri, Camareri likes to say, typically Ironbound is the tip of the spear. You know, we led the coalition to get a right to counsel ordinance passed here in the city, which uh, uh, allows for legal representation of low income uh, residents in housing eviction courts. Mm -hmm. uh, we served on the steering committee uh, that led to the uh, Civilian Complaint Review Board to establish more criminal and racial justice in the city. Um, you know, so there's a lot of work that has gone on, not just in the neighborhood, but, you know, within the city and, of course, around the state, and even more recently with the environmental justice program across the country. Um, and, and I think that's part of that progressive worldview that this organization has always had. And, and, and across the world, I mean, we've had people coming from Japan. We, we uh, had people coming up from Puerto Rico and sharing their fights against toxic waste. Um, so if you look through those Ironbound Voices issues, you'll see lots of examples of even international connections. All right, thank you. And our next um, and final archival slide you may have noticed as Nancy's going around the room or Joe. Oh. ICC has a thing for t-shirts, um, <laughs> which- And buttons. And buttons. So, the, so this is at once meant to, to represent um, the archival objects that are here. T-shirts, buttons, banners, awards, um, all sorts of objects, you know, non-paper, non- Non photos that um, are in the archive. So, if somebody complain what or explain what the deal is with the ICC um, and t shirts and what these specific t shirts um, evoke, um, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I want to know why we love t shirts. I have like a thousand ICC <laughs> t shirts, all of varying quality, by the way, too. Like some that have been the protest is happening. Remember the one that we had the meeting on the uh, hearing? We just press the thing was pressed on. Some of them were upside down because it was done so hastily yep. Yep. <laughs> the night before. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to hear if there's a history behind the t-shirts because we do continue to have a lot of t-shirts for mm -hmm. our uh, organizing. And back before my time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so program. So the, 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 on, sure. on, the one on the right, uh, it, the orange one down. If you, I don't know if people can read it because. These things do get faded over years <laughs> sitting in our closets. But you know, that was a, a line through the garbage incinerator. Uh, and it says, you know, don't burn. And it's really every time you had a battle, you want it, it was a way of spreading the message. So yeah, you could have flyers, you could have a TV show, where that's the incineration we actually went in boats to uh port and and to protest that, you know, so that was a unique one with Greenpeace, but t-shirts are another one, It's and buttons are another one, because everywhere you go, people are seeing that message, mm. and hopefully they engage you in conversation. I think people just like t-shirts. So I think <laughs> I, I, it's a good way to get people, like, one of the marches, I think, the kids were like, are we, they, we give the kids the t-shirts first, and their kids are like, am I getting my t-shirt? <laughs> So I think people just love t-shirts. So it's a good way to draw more people into the cause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But to Arnold's point, it's a good visual, right? And it definitely, uh, when you're thinking about getting the word out, right, folks always have a tendency. I know I read t-shirts. You walk by me with a t-shirt, a good t-shirt, a bad t-shirt, I'm reading your t-shirt. So <laughs> it's a good way to just uh, spread the word um around whatever activities we're having right or whatever we're trying to spread the word about the the, the one on the left the always uplift never uproot seems yeah. particularly again yeah. like evocative i keep using this word but what does that mean to you so um that that t-shirt we uh we made when we were developing the affordable housing inclusionary zoning ordinance and there's a lot of talk about gentrification and displacement in the city, you know, some years back. And that actually was made for our gala. Mm -hmm. We handed that out because at, at our big gala, 400 people or so, you have a lot of corporate people there. And we wanted them to know that this is, you know, people who live in the city are, are, are meaningful. And, you know, the always uplift was basically you can't have a Newark Renaissance without the people of Newark. So you have to uplift people, not just put up new buildings. Uh, 
So that that was the es essential, you know, essentially the slogan there. Always uplift, never uproot, meaning very specifically the people of Newark. It's all about the people. All right. And one final slide. Your t-shirts in my backpack too, if anybody wants to see. Oh, <laughs> find him if oh, he's got the <laughs> I'm, I messed up. I, I meant to update this slide and I had already sent the slideshow off to the library and then I updated it on my own computer and never sent. So anyway, this was supposed to give you an idea um, that the Ironbound Community Corporation Archives is opening next year. Um, there's just a, like a, a, one more stack of boxes um, that Kat's been talking about um, to go through. Um, but there are some um, ICC archival sources um, available already. Um, and that's what the rest of the list is, including the Ironbound Environmental Justice History and Resource Center, uh, which was mentioned before at the Van Buren uh, branch of the Newark Public Library. Um, and the digital Newark Public Library collection um, includes um, an entire uh, group of ICC records. And the other piece that, um, that I added but didn't um, make it over here is the Picturing Justice uh, Photo Archive, um, which is a Tumblr site. So if you just Google Picturing Justice, um, you'll get it and you'll see some of the you know, incredibly rich um, photos over the decades of various campaigns and various people um, with the ICC. So I thought I just, I just end with this question to, to any and all of you um, is sort of what is your hopes for the ICC archives and what it can accomplish and what it can do for the organization um, and for the neighborhood and for Newark in the world. Hazel, you sure. want to get us started? I'll get started, thanks. Um, as being part of the archive committee and working with CAT, I have definitely learned a lot about the history of the organization. Um, I think learning about the history of the organization definitely helps us in moving forward, planning, moving forward, and as an organization, understanding what some of the fights have been about. If Nancy, for example, is not available, if Joe is not available, we have a link that we can go to, that we can reference to see the, the past and the future, right? Because we also have some of that most present work that we've seen that it's included in the archive. And we can use that, right, as a method to move forward. So I think it's important. History is important, right? Um, history is important to, to, to understanding, again, you know, what we've, what we've gone through, what we've fought for, what we've established, right, as an organization. And using that to move forward is very important to me. So I am dedicated to continuing to archive and continuing to archive, you know, our current day events, right? So someone 15 years ago, have 15 years in the future, have something to look at, have documents to look at to see how did ICC move forward, something for our youths to look at, right? Um, I believe that's very important. Thank you. Shameless plug, uh, uh, follow Ironbound Community Core and uh, on Instagram and Ironbound Environmental Justice on Instagram and Facebook. Ooh, pull out your phones, join now. <laughs> you know, uh, it's great to look at the past, but you got to also be up to date and current on, uh, on social media too, because they're very active. ICC is constantly changing, lots of activities, lots of happening. So um, really good social media presence. So please join that too. I mean, to me, the past is prologue, right? So. Um, my biggest wish for the archive is that um, the future generations of Newark residents and activists that are coming out of the community now um, see themselves represented in their history and see their voices and their experiences honored in, in what they're doing. Because so much of the history, you know, I'm a professor, right? So a lot of what the students read and the books are written by you know, people outside, you know, studying it from afar, you know, looking at the experience of the other. And the archive is an opportunity for people to tell their own stories, to use their own voices um, and direct experiences, lived experiences to be honored and centered. And that's what I hope that 
the archive brings forward and continues to live on is to bring forward the voices and experiences and lives of the residents themselves and the activists themselves that did that work. Um, and so it's not just being told by somebody else. We tell our own history and that's the most powerful history. Um, so yeah, so I hope you guys check it out, but also check out what's currently happening with Ironbound. So check us out on social media too. I think that last thing Anna said, you know, about storytelling and uh, what the, I think the first slide is voices from the archives, mm -hmm. I think it is, you know, that um, you know, we need to be telling our own story. We don't need you know, like professors telling stories about organizations and communities. Communities need to tell their own stories. And I think for me, for the archives, it's an opportunity to not just know a story, not just know the organization, know the history, but feel it. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I think it's the uh, heart and soul of the organization, which is really so powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, personally for me, um, it, it's just so gratifying to be able to have work that I did back in the 70s continue today, to have people doing the same work have the same vision being carried on. It's just personally so rewarding. Okay, can we please thank our, oh, hold on, we'll get you, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we please thank our panelists. And so we have um, a few minutes for um, some Q&A with the panelists um, and with Kat. Um, the archivist. Um, as you're gathering your thoughts, I just wanted to see if Nancy had anything she wanted to say real quick. You can speak in the microphone. Yes, I wanted to answer the question we started with a little bit. What's the use of doing this? And to do that, I brought the guest book. Van Buren Library has, has an archive in three languages, and the cards for this are on the table on the side. If you are interested, pick one up. You can come anytime the library is open, go up to the second floor and look at what is there. So I brought the guest book from that exhibit in the library, and I just wanted to share the first page with you. The first page has entry from Mildred Crump, who at that time was on the council. She said, thank you so much for this, this struggle to protect this wonderful community from becoming an environmental wasteland. Keep up the great work. And then underneath Mildred, there's a community resident who's not here, but who's still a part of Spark after all these years. Lito Miranda, and he wrote the date and he put down next to it, I'm a part of history. And then we have the eighth grade teacher from Oliver Street School. Very inspiring. It is very empowering to see the environmental community come together. I'm looking forward to bring my students to the exhibit. We have the special assistant, Anita Ziad, special assistant to the Newark Public Schools. Thanks for providing such rich history. And we have the parent coordinator from the East Central Region. This is a wonderful introduction to the various efforts made to keep the Iron Bounds clean and safe for its citizens. I look forward to bringing parents to learn about this important issue. And I wanted to end with uh, well, two, two that I thought were very good. Emily Sanchez in 2023, we're jumping to the present. Thank you so much for creating this amazing archive. I love it. It's so accessible and multilingual. We need more archives like this across New Jersey, recounting the struggles and wins of working class communities. And the last one, the vice president, vice principal from Eastside High School, who is now the principal of uh, New Jersey History High School, Margaret Murray. Thank you, ICC, for all the, quote, good trouble, end quote, you have gotten into. Keep fighting the fight for equality and social justice in the Ironbound and in Newark. So that's why it's 
I think that sort of sums up why it's important, why the archive can be useful and inspiring to people. Thank you. So I'm, I'm told if you are watching online that you can drop a question in the chat and that will miraculously get to us somehow. Um, but any questions um, from you all here? Uh, thank you. Thank you to Nancy. Thank you to the whole crew that's been working on this. And um, I'm part of that era. I go back with Arnold and Nancy. They were my first friends in Newark. So um, a lot of this relates to experiences I've had with all of you, and I appreciate it. Um, there are, when I saw the burning, uh, Stop Burning Newark, I thought back to 1980, when we had a citywide coalition, Newark Coalition for Neighborhoods, which Ironbound Corporation was a major part of and it's a promoter of. Uh, but that group had an anti-arson project because they were burning for profit buildings in Newark, just like they were in Boston and cities across the country. And we had a project that studied that and basically documented seeing where the trends were. So that was a, a Trish Jarecki was part of that. She lived in the Ironbound, was a big part of that. So that was a groundbreaking kind of citywide effort. And then uh, later, uh, people from across the city worked, of course, over the past 10 years to save the Newark water system. And that was a citywide effort. Um, the East, East Ward was big in that. And we had a critical time when we were having hearings in every ward. And I'll never forget, the last hearing was in the East Ward. And it was touch and go because Cory Booker wanted to use it to cut his expenditures, cut taxes, and take away basically public access to our water system. Well, we were worried about whether the homeowners in the East Ward would come out for this. To a person, they came out and said, don't take our water. That was organizing by ICC and people from across the city. So it's been a, a big, long effort with a lot of victories and a lot of accomplishments. My question is, who is grabbing the data from uh, Facebook? And is it possible to grab that? And uh, it, can that be preserved? Because now that we don't have paper, thank you. <laughs> yes, so all of the social media is currently being archived um, through the Internet Archive and Archivit. Sorry. Uh, through Internet Archive and Archivit. Um, it actually, there's uh, basically a set seeds uh, to capture and it captures on a quarterly basis. So um, four times a year, it captures all of the social media presence, um, all of the posts, all of the updates, and it preserves it um, digitally in a work file. So I, I'm also hoping at the end of the archive project is we'll be able to preserve the actual work files, the actual digital files. They're very large. No, you can't really look at them, um, but so that ICC will have that content available well into the future, and there will constantly be emulation software available to preview, like to preview and view um, internet content. Great, yeah. Already, yeah. We're trying to capture everything. <laughs> Any other questions? We have about five minutes, just so you all know. I have only taken four and a half. <laughs> um, first off, thank you for this wonderful evening. Everything you all do is incredible. Um, I will make a quick statement before my question, if I can. Um, but it goes to why this archive is so important. Is, is this? Yeah. It's, oh, OK. Um, <laughs> so first off, I, I can't teach an ethos or an ethic, but Hazel, Anna, Joe, and Arnold all spoke to different things about the community. What gets lost and what we need more than anything is that culture of community, loving their neighbor, building on from their neighbor. There's very few, everybody talks about it, but there's very few places that live it every day. And one of the beauties of that and why it's so important to preserve is that a lot of us learn from this. I started under Andy Wilner 
And you guys have so many victories, you forget them all. You throw them away. Because I remember that was the first time I was engaged with you with New York, New Jersey Baykeeper was yeah. when you were fighting Bear Stadium, yeah. going into absolutely the wrong place. And I remember saying to Andy, I said, Andy, I don't know these folks, but they're a small community group. And it seems like everybody in the world disagrees. And he's like, no, these are our people. These are who, basically what he said is you'd rather lose with them than win the wrong <laughs> fight or not fight the fight. But we Baykeeper, a lot of what um, what you all brought is reflected, we're a regional group, but we've learned from you and try to reflect it and try to keep those values, which gets lost because a lot of, the, you know, frankly, a lot of the conservation groups, and this happens everywhere, but I know the conservation world is, well, you don't want to say anything because you don't want to upset the governor because we want to be in good with the governor and that happens, and the, the higher up you go, right, the farther you away, move away from the people, the more you want to be the one cutting the deal and being the, you know, the intermediary. And Ironbound has been the, the antithesis of that. Um, and it's, it's reflected on us and on other folks. So that, this archive is incredibly important. The work you do is incredibly important, right? That's my question. No. Uh, so, um, I just, um, I'm wondering, here's my question. How is, is there other ways that you can act as yourself when you do the archive and get it out to other folks so that hopefully cultures change, right? That it changes cultures, community by community and other places. And I know you do it, but I'm wondering if there's new avenues and new ways to do that. Um, take all this work and and help other folks see the world in a, in a better light in the way that you address it. I don't, you're the expert, Kat, on the how to share it. I, I would say that, like, I think today we, we have to, a lot of it is online. Like, we have to be able to share the archive, you know, digitally and online and make it accessible to people, um, you know, in, in various ways. There's also a lot of film now. Like, there's a film called Sacrifice Zones that features Ironbound, Maria, Maria from the Ironbound and other folks from here. So. I feel like it's multimedia, like in order to get to people, because a lot of people can't physically go to the Van Buren Library. So to be able to see it, you got to go online. Yeah. I will say it's really important to remember that just because it's online doesn't mean it's here forever either. So it is really important to capture this content in the time that it was created, in the time that it's being used, and within that context. So saving those links that are embedded in websites are really important to see what we're linking out to, how we're connecting as communities, who we're working with. And so allowing that to be kind of packaged and advocated by the organization themselves, I think is the most sustainable way to create and preserve an archive. But I'll also say it's really important to just care, just like Nancy, you'd care about the record. And so within that tiny seed of a thought is how do you keep it? Where do you keep it? Why do you keep it? That's all an archive is. And that is just the history, the first person in that time history of what was going on. And it is really important to just start caring or continue to care because there are open source products available um, like the internet archive that captures digital content live um, as it's available, but it does take someone to put that information into the system so that it can, it can capture our history. And so setting up that community archive is just someone who cares, just like I, ICC. And it's so, it is really inspiring. And, and I would say that it's really purpose to be here today is so that every one of you can then be sharing that this exists, you know, the, ICC staff is out in the community. We're all at meetings. We're all talking to lots of people. Now we know this exists, and we can share with folks that it's here. And Greg, if we had a million dollars, we can do anything. <laughs> but we're probably talking to the wrong crowd. <laughs> but anybody out there in the virtual world? <laughs> oh, my name is Cynthia. I'm from the community. I used to work at ICC. And I, in terms of like, how does this get multiplied? I mean, ICC went national during the last decade we started to participate i mean 
uh, we went to the climb in March in Washington, and then we, we started doing more and more things. We went to Detroit to a social forum. And now ICC is part of networks of other communities that are similar. And I watch people having to share that information. Unfortunately, it's usually a problem. Like I have to go home tonight, do a call on hydrogen hubs with communities, right? And we're all drawing on each other's resources, contacts as we step into new horrible types of pollution. But there's more vehicles for sharing that information. I just want to say thanks for this amazing panel, being able to be more insightful about the things that have happened in the history of the Ironbound and being able to continue that type of work that we're doing as an organizer at ICC as well. Um, and I wouldn't be doing that without making a note of a lot of the folks that live here, if not most of y'all are residents of Newark, and we still have fights like the ones that we talked about today. And right now we are still trying to fight having a fourth fossil fuel power plant coming into the Ironbound. And you know, we're a four square mile community here. So that would be one power plant for every mile that people live in, right? So we definitely wanna urge and encourage everyone to reach out to your local elected officials, consumer rent, the SROEs, and making sure that they know that that's not what you want here in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Young staff making us proud. <laughs> So I am not calling an end to the conversation, but only to this phase of it. Um, so we invite you to continue the conversation uh, with food in the back. Please check out um, the table of archival items that Nancy Zach um, has brought with her and put on display. Um, thank you all for joining us here tonight. And please, one more time, thank Kat and the panel. Have a good night. Thank you.